So, you guys know I've been hyping up this movie, Searching for the Longest Time. People have been asking me, yo, you're talking about how there's this secret movie that was in there? You're talking about all these things? I don't believe you. I get this all the time. People don't believe that I'm seeing things in movies. So sometimes I got to go get the producer himself, Mr. Sevohanian right here. <laughs> my buddy Zach from the Intercut Podcast. And we're going to we're gonna talk about everything in this movie. And the reason why I think it's one of the best movies that's out there. The reason why... This is like one of the movies that you can watch over and over and over again. I think MoviePass canceled their subscription service or limited it because they knew there was going to be a movie that was going to come out. But, Sev, uh, I don't think you need any introduction because we've talked several times in the past. But introduce yourself to everybody else. Thanks, man. Uh, hey, guys. I'm Sev Ohanian. I'm the uh, co-writer of Searching and producer of Searching. And I first met Arturo at the Chicago Critics Film Festival back in May, I think. Yeah. I was out there with Anish, and uh, we, you know we did like a whole bunch of we did a great screening, and then we did like maybe twelve interviews back to back, and one of those interviews I remember being like an incredibly cerebral and like quite intelligent interviewer who like had a really good grasp on our film that I was really impressed with, and I wanted to kind of keep in touch with them. But he didn't want to keep in touch with me, so I figured I'd just talk to Arturo instead. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's messed up. I'm totally kidding. That was... I was about to say, I'm like, I'm going to slip you the five. <laughs> no, but no, but seriously, like, Arturo, like, we, I remember we really, we really, like, connected, like, immediately because I think, I mean, it, it was a bunch of great critics out there, don't get me wrong, and, like, a lot of them who I still keep in touch with, but you were, like, the one guy, like, you were, like, yo, like, like, like you were just so blown away by the movie, and it was a really endearing, earnest response that I was like, man, like, I feel like if I had to watch this movie, I would be Arturo. So I just really <laughs> appreciated you. And, like, also, like, you know, we've, we've been able to travel with Searching now, you know, ever since the premiere in January. We've gone, you know, to so many different cities in America. We've gone to so many different countries. And we get asked all the same questions, you know, like, which is totally fine. Like, you know, the incredible casting choices, obviously, like that Anish and I made, Anish and our team made, I should say, and like our computer element, which is a given, the thriller aspect, the mystery, all these things. No one had ever asked us about Easter eggs. Like no one had ever asked us about like, hey, I saw something in there. Like, what was that all about? And uh, that was you. And like, and you know, it was cool. Like it was just so cool because we'd been working on this film for so long and never been able to talk about these things. And, and here you were. And I remember in the days after this after searching had come out i was on reddit which i'm a big fan of and somebody mentioned like hey like this whole secret subplot uh you know like what is it i was like how do you even know about that and they linked me to the interview that you that you posted with me and anish and it was like oh man arturo i gotta get in touch with that guy again so do you you remember the bet we made that day right remind me because i know i i i fulfilled my end of it <laughs> so I remember we were talking about all these Easter eggs, right? Because we had this great screening and we, you know, Nish and I kind of like dropped the hint that, you know, searching because it took so long to make and because it was so intensive, we took the opportunity to really hide a bunch of like secret subplots, mystery, like foreshadowings and a lot of fun Easter eggs. And I can't remember whether it was Anish or me who first mentioned like, but there's a big one, like this huge Easter egg that spans the entire length of the film. I call it my magnum opus because it's, you know, my masterpiece, I guess. And yep. you were like, well, what is it? And I remember there was this, like, fervor in your eyes. You had, like, this hunger. And, and me and Anish were like, dude, like, we can't tell you. But, like, we were like, maybe one day, months after the movie is released, yeah. somebody may find it. And I remember we were talking about something. You were like, I'm going to see it again. And, uh, and, and I said to you something like, well, if you see it, I'm going to give you an exclusive interview because... Or if you're the yeah, first one to find it or something, and like, I think it was like less than 12 hours after the movie had come out, you sent me a single image that <laughs> was so it was a gift. slick. Uh, so, I don't know if I want to spoil it yet, but it was like, I was like, yeah. dude, this dude knows his Easter eggs. And I was like, dude, mad respect, man. It's going to be great to actually get deep into spoilers here. <laughs> I know you haven't had a chance to do a lot of spoiler interviews, and no, it'll yeah. be cool to really talk about all the hidden details, all the Easter eggs, all the thought you put into the movie, because that's one of the things that Art and I both look for in movies, and, mm -hmm. and you think the repeat watchings of Searching really uh, emphasize this, that it's just loaded with information. Every single frame, there's been attention paid to the details, uh, mm -hmm. and it's great to see 
movies that give you that depth that actually reward your close attention. Yeah, this is what I always saw. This is the audience I had built. I said, pay attention to movies. Go in there and watch them. Some people went into searching watching a little too closely, and they were able to guess some stuff from the front, which I know you'll talk about as well. The fact that the whole movie is already there in the first 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You guys like clues in and out. Like I said, I've seen it, what, five times? And I'm still picking up things. And I know we're going to talk about things that people won't be able to pick up until another release is out. Some things none of us may ever know. But uh, I want to talk about... Uh, one of the big ones, which was uh, you, you, when we first did the interview, um, without like having put a lot of spoilers when it first came out, I first saw it at Sundance. And when I first saw it, I remember I was talking to you guys. It was originally called Search. Yes. And then they switched it to Searching. And uh, when you guys had released it, there was um, a lot of like viral marketing going on with it. I know for those, I'm, I'm not sure if the website is still on. Pretty much, you can go on the website on mobile, and you would be able to go on John Cho's phone. Yeah, findmargo.com. If you go on findmargo.com on any smartphone, it gives you access to David Kim's cell phone, and you could literally look up information about the case. And believe it or not, Anish and myself and Natalie, our partner, we actually wrote that. We like we we were directly in charge of all of that, and we actually put in a bunch of secrets and clues in that as well. Hey. All right, well, I'm going to have to go back and look through some of those other ones. But for the movie, <laughs> having seen it multiple times, there's a bunch of cool cool parts dealing with, like, the main plot, which I've always been telling and telling people on it. I said, the main plot alone is fantastic. It's worth watching it. But when these two come in and do this whole other subplot that's in here, right? <laughs> if y'all have seen it right here, I get tweets all the time. I know Seb sees them because I've been retweeting everybody who's gone to go see the movie. You know, I've yeah. got there's even people in the Netherlands who have tweeted me going, "Yo, we have jam packed this house." People in Australia that's just crazy. timing for it to come out, and then I'll get a, I'll get a tweet back with a simple hashtag, Green Lightning. <laughs> So I don't know if you want to start there or if you want to start with some of the other ones, it's up to you. Yeah, consider this your spoiler warning. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in, man, I don't even know where to begin. And like, so. Well, where was the idea for Green Lightning? How did it even make it into Searching? So the, the script for Searching is 117 pages long, right? And that script details the entire story of the Kim family from the first moment Margo makes her user account on Windows XP down to the very ending where David turns off his computer. And we came to realize around the time of editing the film that in reality the script for searching is probably well over a thousand pages. And the reason is because when you watch the film, you know, David might open up his email inbox to go grab you know, the phone number of Margo's piano teacher, but he has to scroll past 40 other emails to get there, not to mention ads on the side and comments and text messages that we'll never even really truly see. And it became very clear to us that like someone had to write all that, and I guess it was us. Uh, and it was unique because in editing the film, we were using two IMAP computers that you basically would buy your kids to do their homework on. It wasn't necessarily the most professional yeah. getup. We just didn't have the resources at the time. And, and it was even shot, right, on his phone? The 90% of the movie is shot on an iPhone 7, uh, the one that Anish has. And I don't mean the model of the phone that Anish has, but uh-huh. rather like Anish's cell phone that's in his pocket today is what the movie was shot on. And when we would ask our editors to make an edit, it would often take like 20 minutes. Like they would say, give us 20 minutes, we'll get it done. So it just because it was so render intensive. And... Um, what that meant was we had a lot of time on our hands and specifically a niche like credit to him came up with this like really organized system where like every you know he split up all of the scenes into like different chapters and he assigned me a couple of them and like i remember i had a lot of fun going through like Derek ellis if you guys remember that character and like filling out all of the instagram pictures he has and like what are the comments on them like i love like i love reading Derek ellis's instagram like comments they're so funny can i actually like read you guys one of them right now Go Please for go it. ahead. I have. I just like it's. It's my. It's my one of my favorite things to read. Uh, <laughs> give me two seconds. I'm gonna pull it up. And I Derek a, Ellis being the one who went to the Justin Bieber concert, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have the a copy of the movie on my computer. You guys want me to send it to you guys? Would that be easier? <laughs> hey, you know what? Yeah, just send it over. You just Dropbox it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So. All right. So Derek Ellis, the most amazing character. Uh, so there's a picture of him. 
<laughs> there's a sorry, I'm like cracking up in my own movie, but uh <laughs> So then there's a, it says there's a picture of him holding up like a Jack Daniels or whatever, like a, a, a bottle of booze with his friends. And his yeah. comment is, Derek Ellis 6969 says, regular Friday night, LMAO. And then Anish Chaganty replies, ha ha ha, sa, dude. Because <laughs> Anish used to walk in and be like, a sa, dude. And then, uh-huh. and then Nat QQ, which is Natalie, says, you crazy but kind of cute. And then Sevohanian says, who bought that for you, your dad, LMAO? <laughs> And then Derek Ellis replies, yo, Sev, say that again. I buy my own drinks. So it's like this, the idea that like he comes across as like a hard ass to David, but in reality, he's not. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then like, you know, and then there's, a, there's like the picture of him like smoking with that, you know, smoke coming out. And his comment says, my mom keeps asking why I spray so much Febreze in my room. LOL. <laughs> <laughs> and then like some, and then someone no, else says, that's t- not even weed. And someone says, very nice. How much? Parentheses Borat voice. Like it's just <laughs> totally like the kind of comments you see on Instagram. But yeah, we just spent, you know, a good part of a year writing every one of these like comments and ads and emails. Mm-hmm. And just by naturally doing it, we started to create these little subplots all throughout the film. If you really watch closely, there's like 10 other tiny subplots happening throughout the entire events of the film, um, mostly very small. Like you, there's a woman named Hannah Couch that David went on a date with apparently because in the first scene when he's you know, FaceTiming with Margot mm-hmm. when she's at her study group and she's like, hey, David, I really enjoyed dinner last night or last week. Would love to get together again. And then you know, the next day in the story, she sends him another text saying, uh, well, would you just see in the corner saying something like, hey, David, just following up, making sure you got my message. Would really love to get together. So it's like kind of like he's ignoring her. And then, like a few days later, when the Margot, you know, disappearance becomes the local news, she sends another note saying, "Oh, your daughter is missing," and like you kind of see her like implying like maybe next yeah. week. So we had a lot of fun with these subplots, um, and some of them were kind of emotional. Like I know Anisha's favorite is in Korean throughout the film. David is the mom. Exactly, you saw that David is. I messing- caught it. You caught it great. I mean, you. Yeah. It, I, don't I can't understand. It, like <laughs> obviously the message is in there, but I I could tell that that was his mom. It's really like it gives me chills whenever, like whenever, like if you translate it. But basically, you know, she knows about Margot and she's reaching out, saying what's going on because she lives in South Korea, and you see emails with them trading about flights, like booking her a flight to come over and be with her family, be with her son. Mm-hmm. And then the last one that you get from her is she's like, "I'm at the airport. There's Wi-Fi here." So it's like it's like that like sense of like she's in. T- it's like, so it's cool. It's lived like, in though. That's yeah. That's the movie. It's lived in. I think that's the beauty of it. Which I know you have so many more to give, and I know you're gonna reveal every single one of them. To <laughs> well, us I don't here. know about that. Uh, but, but like our, our but goal like, is, we just wanted to be pause proof, man, because like Anish and I watched every screen movie that we could get our hands on when we were developing, searching, and we watched a lot of movies that are just about tech and. The one common denominator was always like those movies, if they ever show something that was technological, A, it would usually be not at all like how it really works, and B, like, Mm -hmm. if you pause it, it didn't hold up. Like, it was just gibberish, or like, it just felt like a missed opportunity for storytelling, so why not enrich it and add, like you said, world build and add texture, and, and at the same time, why not have fun? Mm-hmm. 100% I agree and I, I love how you guys are able to like incorporate yourselves into it like you had your names the uh, other producers names the directors I know you guys filled it in with a bunch of uh, your friends and family I know you had spoke about using your own mom as well <laughs> my mom is the piano that? teacher that's her picture and her it's her maiden name Vartui Shahini and her real name is Ohanian but I figured that'd be distracting uh, but yeah <laughs> I mean like it was it was a, I mean, partially it was because we were just a low-budget film and secondly, it was like everyone, you know, when you're a filmmaker, and I'm sure you guys can relate just by being, you know, having your shows, like everyone and my relatives and friends are always like, when are you going to put me in one of your movies? And like, Anish yeah. puts it the best way. It's like, this is the one movie where everyone's in it. So like, they can't mm-hmm. ask anymore. Yeah. Um, even, even if you're in a text. And now, did you use the real text messages? Because I think you had said something like that. Were they fabricated text messages or was it like the last text message that they sent you? You just said, all right, that's going in there. No, we, we wrote everything from scratch. We just put their names okay. or their photos in some cases. Um, you know, like I think every single text is relevant to the story in some way. There's references, little things like that. Um, but yeah. And I mean, all of this developed from that spreadsheet that uh, you and Anish were working on? Like, exactly. Is this, how, exactly. How big was the spreadsheet at the end? Dude, massive. It's a scroll. I mean, completely massive. Uh, I don't even know if I could find it anymore. Let's see if I can maybe find it for you guys. Oh, wow. You know what I'm going to show you guys? 
I'm not going to show you guys that other thing because I can't find it. But when we talk about my magnum opus, I'm going to show you guys yeah. how we organized it. This is so funny. Uh, <laughs> okay, cool. So, um, but yeah, so like speaking, just going to the magnum opus, like throughout the course of doing it, I think even even back to writing the film, I had this weird idea of like, what if we just, what if because the movie is going to span so many emails and texts and eventually news articles and, and you know, news streams we're gonna have to populate all those news things and we had two goals one of which was to, to really ground the movie in reality and like we knew from the moment this film was finished being shot it was a period movie and like we would not be able to keep up with all the like tech tech devices being updated and the UIs being changed so we just stuck to the idea that our movie takes place May 11 2017 that's the day Margot was missing and one of the ways we wanted to kind of add realism to that is we had a lot of references of things that actually happened on that on that week. And uh, and um, ironically, I think we chose May 11, 2017, because we thought that's when the movie would come out. We were off by about a year and three months, because that's how long it took. Uh -huh. But uh, we have real news articles, things that were happening in, in that weekend or whatever. Hmm. And the other thing for me was like, what if we kind of wrote this other story and had it in the background of every single scene that you would never even notice. And I was inspired by a couple of things, and I think one of them, one of them that I can remember is, do you guys ever watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer? I haven't seen that. I, Catch I, up. I think, it's, I think it's brilliant. Um, yeah. There's, there's one episode that like features kind of like one of Buffy's, I'm sure you guys know the basic premise, but Buffy's oh, yeah. like sidekick characters, who's kind of like, like the, the loser of the group, and he's having like this really, really crazy night where he's dealing with a minor nuisance throughout the entire night. It's kind of getting him, driving him all over town, trying to overcome this little minor nuisance. But in the background of this episode, like, like he keeps encountering Buffy and the others who are dealing with something massive. And like, it turns out that they're, they're trying to save the world from ending. And it's like this really interesting way like that story was in the background. Or like, you know, in Community, which is one of my favorite shows, uh, there's an entire episode where, you know, it takes place on this community college, and like in the background, there's always extras eating food, sitting in class, walking around. That throughout the entire background of this episode, there is like a couple that like are giving birth, and it's yeah, there's weird. a woman that's pregnant, and Abed's talking to them. Exactly. And... You would never notice it though. I don't. I generally don't think I noticed it until I read about it online. And like throughout the entire episode, there's this entire backstory happening. And it was so beautifully done because the rest of the episode is just shot exactly how they would normally shoot it with no extra attention given to it. And, and like also on Community, I thought, you know, one of the most brilliant Easter eggs I think of all time is like over the course of, I think it was three seasons, uh, they found ways to have characters say the word Beetlejuice. And it would be in a very innocuous way. Someone would say, I don't know, what a horrible outfit you're wearing. You look like Beetlejuice. Like, you know, stupid little zinger, no big deal. And then the following season, following year, they would say something else like, oh, it smells like Beetlejuice farted in here or something, again, something innocuous. And then the following year and the next season, again, they found another reason to say the word Beetlejuice. And in that moment where they say that word for a brief second, far in the background, exactly three times they've said Beetlejuice, freaking Beetlejuice walks past the camera. I mean, you'll never notice it. And that is so much planning and so much attention to detail and so much time spent i just found it brilliant because it really does give the series like its rewatchability and like kind of this respect and um we thought about it for search and i and i was trying to think of like well what's a story that would kind of happen throughout the course of this film that would be present but at the same time not too present and that's when we came up with my magnum opus and what's funny is and this is the most funniest thing my whole scheme here as this, you know, I'm a producer as well as being a writer, was the movie will come out, it'll do well in theaters, I think, I hoped. And uh, I was like, I was like, so I was like, okay, a few months after the movie comes out, what if the DVD's coming out? What if we like did this huge expose, like, hey guys, FYI, remember that movie that you guys saw last summer? There was this whole other subplot you didn't see. You missed it. Exactly, and make people want to buy the Blu-ray. And then again, like, Art over here within 12 hours of the movie coming out discovered right. it and then like read it found it not too late after so like that entire plan's gone Sony had Anish and I record like a bunch of like DVD special features where we like walk through a couple of the easter eggs and our tone is probably going to be so stupid because we were like this is us recording the video I mean you'll see this in the blu-ray in a couple months but we're like 
hey guys, you have no idea all the Easter eggs and searching. <laughs> it's like everyone has found them already, guys. Um, but uh, let's talk about it. So, so um, Art, I'd actually, be, I'd actually be really be curious. Like, what was your experience finding this Easter egg? Like, can you? All right. And then, and they'll kind of. It's I'll how bring it went up. for me. When I saw it at Sundance, I was just invested in the story, and I loved it. With everywhere that it went, I thought it was fantastic. The second time that I see it, I'm just there because I, there was so much that was going on, and the reason why I, I wanted to look out for stuff was for the simple reason that the first time that I saw it, I saw a little hashtag on the side on Facebook, and I know you had explained this a little bit more, uh, that said Laura Barnes. Mm-hmm. At that point, I went, all right, I know where she's from. She's from the movie Unfriended. And it just so happens, as I know you'll elaborate a little bit, is that at that certain time, not only was it, I, I want to say, the same company. Yeah, same company, same financier, yeah. That was the exact same year, the exact same time that the whole Laura Barnes situation would have been happening, which is why it's trending at that moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, of course, Cinematic yeah. Universe completely confirmed they're all connected. Yeah, the two fictional totally. timelines overlap. Yeah. On top of that, Knowing that in the back of my mind, I was like, these dudes are fitting stuff in here that I definitely need to check out. So the second time that I was watching at the, at the Chicago Critics Fest, I start seeing things that seem a little out of this world, per se. All right, I see a little thing called hashtag Green Lightning going on Twitter. People are talking about it on Reddit. I see it on the sidelines. I start seeing these NASA conspiracies. The president has to give this speech. And I remember before I had seen it that other time. Um, I, I'm seeing these things and I was like, okay, I'm thinking too much into it. We have the interview. <laughs> you explain how there's a secret Easter egg, but you you refuse to explain it to me. I even left yeah. it at the end of the interview where I say, hey, if you want to, and then I just cut it out. And you, you refuse to. <laughs> but I said, as long as you give me a little bit, I know what to look forward to. And that third time, I DM'd you on Twitter. I said, I'm going to find it. You said, I'm not saying anything. I said, I don't need you to. <laughs> I watch it. The gif I send you is the dude just going, aliens. Yeah. And I was like, dude, you nailed it. That's so impressive. You were literally the first person in history to catch it. So, so here, here's the magnum opus of searching. Like, this is the big Easter egg that Let's go. a couple people Hashtag have already discovered this, but no one has gotten the, like, explanation straight from the source, right? So throughout the course of the events of the film Searching, as David Kim is desperately descending into madness trying to find his daughter, little does he know, and little do most of the people know, there are these other events unfolding all across the world and all across the galaxy. And that mm. is strange anomalies, green lightning, NASA people getting involved, and all these little things adding up to this big revelation at the end of the movie. So basically what's happening is an alien invasion. <laughs> and I love it because Anish hates this, by the way. Like, and, I'll, and I'll explain why. Uh, Basically, we see little glimpses and pieces throughout the film of things that maybe, if you're really paying attention, don't quite add up. It's like you said, there's a hashtag green lightning. There might be a news article about NASA saying, watch out, there's a, there's a storm coming our way. Then you might see people commenting on UCAS saying, hey, you know, like the government is hiding the fact that there's aliens. You'll see like an article saying NASA says there's nothing to fear. But then there's another article saying like a NASA informant was found killed in a, in a yeah. suicide or something then there's like president issues you know like nasa having emergency meeting at the white house defense secretary president like wait what and then it kind of ends with the president about to make an announcement and uh let me just kind of explain to you guys like how we put this together like our, our hope was that um and by the way the reason he doesn't love it and he it's, he does love it but our hope is that all of our movies could be kind of in the same universe because, you know, we're about to shoot our next one. And Anish mm-hmm. always goes, yeah, but, like, that means our next movie is also going to be in a world where the aliens are attacking. <laughs> yeah. And, like, my whole thing to him is, like, dude, maybe the aliens attack, but maybe we beat them. You know, maybe some dude in a fighter, mm-hmm. like, fight plane installed a virus Bruce, on their Mac computer. Bruce so Willis went out there, did his thing, yeah. Exactly. All right, how do I screen share to you guys? Because I'd love to show you guys literally what... Uh, can I even do that on uh, this thing? Yeah, if you yeah, click if you the dots up the corner, in the upper right. Screen share. Okay, cool. Uh, application window. Okay. So can you guys... Yeah, oh, wow. we see. That looks trippy. Whoa. Okay, check this out. <laughs> you guys see this? Yep. So this Whoa. is how this is how we would actually... Um, this is how we would kind of... This is how I kind of organize it and I send it to our editors. So like... On the left, you see all the chapters. Chapter one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
Yeah. Um, and then you see the date. This date represents in the story when things take place, right? We we kind of had we had our whole timeline. So basically, for the first the first magnum opus is the alien sub story. You would see that on you know the sequence where David's looking at the news. Uh, I mentioned that okay, let's create an element which would be an article in the news site, and I wrote the exact copy, which is that NASA has issued an advisory um, for approaching electromagnetic anomaly. And then I added an image, which is green lightning. And this is literally just a picture that I took of the sky. And then I used Photoshop to create these really cheesy lightning effects. The second time is when David's on Margo's, you know, Facebook. There's a trending topic. It says anomaly in the sky, blah, 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 blah. You know, no image. The third time is on UCAST uh, or on Twitter or wherever this is. Yeah, on UCAST, green lightning, green lights, green lightning or whatever was the hashtag. When you, if you guys remember that one brief moment of the girl walking on UCAST, we came up with like, you know, a username that'd be NASA intern. You guys know the green lights are aliens, right? The governor knows what they're not saying. <laughs> then we have like when Margo's being, her car's getting recovered, there's an article, ex NASA, it claims extraterrestrial. And we just use this picture of Anish giving a speech to like be the <laughs> NASA person. Because, you know, every single picture in the movie, we, we own the rights to. We couldn't just steal from anyone. Right. When the reporters find the car, uh, I just there's this picture from one of my film sets. I like really lazily photoshopped caution signs, I and mean, you could see how poorly they're done. Like this oh. is, I think this is literally our crew mm. shooting something on one of my movies. But uh, you know, and then we have this beautiful like this is on YouTube. Whenever you see like real footage of alien sighting yeah. or whatever, this that is, one stood out. This is me literally taking a picture of our crew also in the forest, and I just basically <laughs> uh, made you know something look like an alien. This White House picture is literally, I think Nick Johnson, our editor, took it when he was in Washington, D.C. as a kid. So huh. this is literally how we organize everything. You know, this is kind of like the way we put the entire movie together. It was all a lot of spreadsheets. So David Kim making a spreadsheet to find his missing daughter is 100% what Anish and I would do. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you guys think? Is that, was that good for a, how was that for an exclusive? <laughs> well, we got it right here. We're going to print it on the press and release it fresh in the morning. No, that's 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 like – I think a lot of people don't realize all of the little, like, intricacies that get added to it because, you know, I, I've been hyping up the movie for the longest time, and I'm like, pay attention to all the little details. They give you a reason to watch it again. And I like watching a movie where, like you said, many times before when you're watching something that deals with technology, the messages are just jibber-jabber. They're going through sites, and there's nothing really there. And I know you had mentioned it. I forgot what the phrase was that you had. The for pause it. test, uh, I think it was, we were talking that. about. Pause proof. It's got to be pause proof. Oh, pause if you proof. pause it at any moment, it all makes sense. That, Hopefully. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and to me, it's like when, when a movie does something like that, it, it's, it's respecting the audience. It's giving you a reason to want to watch it again. So the more that I hyped it up, people were like, I don't know about that. Then people come back, and they're like, you didn't notice this. You've yet to mention yeah. this. You, ha you haven't shown – did you not notice all the little intricacies about how – with the alien wear? And I remember <laughs> you and I had talked about that, and other people are now telling me that too. So I don't know if you want to expand upon all the, all, all the little small things there. Um, I would picked up on some other things that as we were, we were reading and hearing about – uh, red herrings <laughs> that are in the movie. So Literal red herrings. Red... I mean, like we, what you're referring to, of course, is when we spoke about this. Uh, that Hannah Party, like the name of the model that Robert uses to, you know, catfish Margot. We specifically wanted to like cast an actress. Um, this amazing actress named Erica did all the photos and the voice, who would have a somewhat memorable look, right? Mm -hmm. And like we thought, oh, what about a redhead? You know, you remember a redhead. And then we're like, yo, red hair, red herring. And like, it was like one of those, one of those really awesome moments for us. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it was, it's been really endearing because at its core, this is a tiny movie that was made with a tiny group of people, right? For a tiny amount of money. And we, the fact that anybody would go see a movie at all when there's so much stuff to watch and you know there's movies that are probably marketed with a lot more money and like mm -hmm. maybe have like you know john cho and deborah messing are phenomenal actors and they're not they're a-list actors but like maybe have a whole ensemble cast of actors our movie was kind of the underdog but we found that people went to see the movie not once not twice but three times to take their friends so they could watch yeah. their friends expressions and the twists so they can catch easter eggs see all the clues that they missed the first time and they did that in theaters like that like we we would all just you know like anish and ali and i we would just we couldn't even cope with that it was just this insane feeling for us and we're so grateful and and you know hopefully the fact that people see the value in in the work that was done on this film you know if you had told us that when we were like 
you know, on our 17th hour of editing in the room with, with Will and Nick, our editors, we would have been like, cool, let's do a couple more hours. It'll be worth it. At the time, mm-hmm. we were only doing it for each other, but knowing that audiences have found the film have been amazing. I appreciate it. And, I mean, I know you had some other Easter eggs in the film, such as... Um what do you know? Shout outs to other filmmakers. Yeah. Sorry, Hollywood that? producer but kills editor, I remember something <laughs> that stood out. That's so funny. That's that is a uh, I have <laughs> Will Merrick who's one of our amazing editors. Uh, we would you know, we got a cabin fever. We're in this tiny room for many, many months. Every now and then to encourage him, I would use a lot of positive reinforcement. Every now and then I would use not so positive reinforcement, <laughs> such as uh-huh. threats to his livelihood and his life. And of course one of them ended up making it in the movie. But uh, no, I mean, it was, yeah, there's, there's so many. It's funny, there, there's a lot more Easter eggs in there that people haven't caught yet, and there's a lot of small ones too. Yeah. The one that, the new one that I, I'm gonna tell you guys about, but I'm also gonna tease you about and not tell you anything about, is there's an Easter egg in the film that a couple of people have found it, but they're confused by it. Because it doesn't, like every other Easter egg is a reference to another movie, it's a reference to a famous quote or one of us, one of the creators, um, where it's obviously like foreshadowing the twist in the film or otherwise world building. But there's this one tiny Easter egg that a couple of people have found it and maybe on Reddit, maybe on Twitter, but they're confused by it and they're trying to find the meaning behind it. And that's the one that I think is like magnum opus part two. And I think there's going to be a long time of people trying to figure out what this Easter egg is, and I just don't see anyone okay. figuring it out anytime soon. So maybe, Arturo, if you want to give it one more shot. <laughs> so w- where in the movie is this? Uh, I Beginning, can't tell middle, you, end? I can't tell you, man. I don't want to find out. All right, I'll, tell, I'll, give, you, I'll give you one clue. It's in the first half of the movie. I'll just tell you that. Okay. All right. We'll be talking about it for when a I long time it, to come, and I'm telling we'll, you, bro. We'll be talking about it for another one over here. But no, yeah, there's, dude, there's, there's a lot. There's the catfish part, you know, it's home of the catfish, of the catfish. that's what the school is, right? Yeah, you see that, that, right that one for us was like, we want, we were, we specifically debated like, is this too obvious of an Easter egg? And for us, it was like, this is the signal to our viewers, to our audiences, that if you see this, pay attention, because there's gonna be a lot more clues out there. That was like the beacon one for sure. Mm-hmm. So that's an interesting point you bring up. I, I, something we had talked about, I know previously, was this idea that you don't want these extra stuff to necessarily overwhelm the central movie. You know, you still are telling the Margot Kim, Kim family story. So uh, what was that balance like, trying to figure out, well, how much can we actually put in? Oh, it was huge. Distracting. Um, You know, we did a really intensive uh, feedback, you know, sessions on, on the edit. We would bring people in, lock the door, show them a rough cut, and then just ask them, like the first time I did this, I asked over 210 questions. Um, literally, like just completely like, did this work? Did you, did you see that? Like, did you guys, did you get that reference? Did you see that twist coming? Like all these little things, like were you bored by this? Did you understand that? And uh, part of it was also like trying to kind of test the Easter eggs. Um, you know, that process actually resulted in one of our Easter eggs becoming actually a plot point. When David is on Pam's account on the Windows XP computer, you know, one of the contact cards he pulls up says something like, parent is an SVPD, divorced family, Mm -hmm. had a crush on Margo growing up, or something like that. And the audience, you know, we assumed in a million years the audience wouldn't even really notice that, and they would just move on, and then maybe somebody would one day realize, wait, that was Vic's son, that was the guy who, like, stalked Margo. And when we did a test screening, to our shock, audiences laughed at that. They chuckle at like, oh, how funny, like mom had written a note about this little boy having a crush on her daughter. And when they laughed at it, we got suddenly very concerned. We're like, yo, is this too obvious now? Like, would you be putting two and two together? Like parent is an SVPD, blah, blah, blah. We had the last name being not Vic, which is explained by the divorced family. But I remember specifically, like this is a huge fight that we had in the edit. We had so many fights and, and all the fights ended in great arg- agreements, but the concern was like, is this too obvious now? Like, if people are going to catch this, we know that we have failed because, you know, we don't, we don't, we figured like a good five percent of everyone who watches the movie would see the ending coming, but we didn't want it to be any more than that. So, and I remember we were like up until the last week of editing, and like I really was the guy pushing to keep that in there because I felt that if you do laugh at that, it'll make you remember it, 
And then by remembering it, when Vic says at the end, he always had a crush on Margo going up, you might remember that and you go, wow, like the clues are all there. So if something that was going to be like a really obscure Easter egg suddenly became kind of like part of the puzzle. But it really meant that we just had to make sure people would see it, laugh at it, but not remember it. Mm-hmm. So to convince Anish, I remember I, I had the editors export the first 20 minutes of the movie. And like I remember Anish was like, yo, let's just show people like that five minute scene. And I was like, dude, no way. We have to, re- we have to recreate the entire experience of watching the film as you would in a the theater on a Blu-ray. And I exported the first 20 minutes of the movie, found five friends and relatives who had no idea what the movie was about, had never seen it, had never heard me talk about it. And I sent them a secure link and I made them watch the first 20 minutes. And it ended like right after that scene. And every one of them was upset at me because they're like, wait, what happens? And I was like, sorry. <laughs> uh, and I was like, I just wanna, I wanna ask you guys a couple, I'm gonna ask you 20 questions about, about what you just saw. And again, we had literally no questions to ask except for how much did you remember that? I remember I'd go like, so what was your favorite scene? I'm like pretending to take notes. Uh, what did you think about like that? And like all these really like questions that I didn't even care about because I was trying to create the scientific ex- method of like getting to the control, right? Or getting past the control. And I asked, hey, do you remember all the cards that David went through? Like, do like, oh, not really. I'm like, you don't remember any of them? They're like, mm. I don't remember. I'm like, I'm like, just really try hard. I don't know. There was like some, I don't remember. And I was like, do you remember the, and I, and I kind of said like a fake one. I'm like, do you remember the kid who like, uh, you know, bit Margo one time? They're like, no, I don't remember that. I'm like, do you remember the kid who kissed Margo? They're like, mm, no, I'm like, I'm like, do you remember the kid who had a crush on Margo? And they'd go, wait, wait, wait. I'm like, a crush on Margo? They're like, yes, I do remember that. I'm like, great. Who was their parent? I have no clue. And I was like, okay, great. Perfect. Mm-hmm. Like that, that was just what we wanted. We just. The fact right. that those five people had that experience, I, I literally, as you can imagine, made a spreadsheet I showed to Anish, and he was like, cool, let's do it. And, and you know, it's become one of, the, one of our favorite, you know, little foreshadowings of the movie. But yeah, and so it was important to us that Easter eggs never gave away the, the plot too much. But in this case, it was a happy accident that they kind of really added to it in a really cool way. It's really cool. That's dope. Um, one of the things we had talked about last time was besides the beach ball of death as we called it you called it the rainbow god uh (laughs) was was just pretty much giving a big shout out to the editors because of all of the work that they did i know you had posted the little time lapse of literally it's not a it's not a screen recording no that was one of the biggest hurdles that i had with like telling people about the movie people thought it was just going to be a gimmick i'm like this ain't no gimmick i don't i don't promote gimmicks this is the real (laughs) deal and and now like first of all like stuckman Shout out to Stuckman came out. He was like moved by the movie because of Anisha's like praise for Shyamalan, who he loves as well. And then there's that little <laughs> Easter egg in the movie where, yeah. where he says that uh, M. Night notices this new director and like brings him under his wing in a sense. Uh, he liked it. YMS, shout out to him, one of the most nitpicking people on the game on YouTube. <laughs> Even he was surprised by it, you know? Yeah. So it's like now that people are, are, are seeing this, it's like, there's substance in this movie mm-hmm. and a lot of it goes to the editors who were able to not again screen record the thing these guys cut out every single bit put it on the screen keyed it in and uh i don't know if you if maybe you'll send us a, an image of it or not mm-hmm. the present which is literally i have not stopped talking about it to, ever since you showed it to us that uh, you know you you explain it i mean it's Will Merrick and Nick Johnson, uh, if this movie in an insane, bizarre world ever wins or is nominated for any awards, everybody on our entire team, actors included, all the way up to Sony, will agree with you and tell you, like, it's got to go to the editors. Like, they have to get recognized for their work because (laughs) on one hand, they technically achieved something that had never been done before. And B, on the other hand, creatively they pioneered this like it, it, it it's not only that these guys are whizzes like in computers like they're artistic geniuses so early on like you know searching is not the first movie to, to take place on screens mm-hmm. and part of what made us want to do the movie was that we were wanted to do something that hadn't been done before and like every other film for the most part is like one big wide shot it never moves the camera and they're all in real time like a lot of them and yeah. like the, there's no editing there's no montage nothing and then, then they're all, for some reason, like, stuck on a single computer's perspective. 
right from the beginning, we were like, why? Like, it's already such a restrictive thing to tell a story on a computer. Why make it even more, why do that to yourself, you know? And like, it reminded us of, of like the earliest days of filmmaking where they would just set up a camera, point it at like a group of actors who would perform in front of it. And in our minds, like there's been a hundred years of cinematic techniques that have been developed let's use them like let's have the camera move and be a character and have montages and mise en scene or whatever like let's make this a cinematic experience and the only way to do that was to not screen record because you know those other mm -hmm. films oftentimes and we, we know the people who made them like you record your screen you act out on your mouse kind of like what you guys were seeing me doing earlier and you record that and then that becomes a shot or it becomes a setup or a scene we couldn't do that because we needed the cameras to move and have like enough resolution that we could zoom in and cut. And that meant we had to basically recreate the internet from scratch. And our editors, and you know, you guys should check out that time last video that wow. Art mentioned. It is mind boggling the amount of stuff they did. I, I would probably imagine if, if had they and all of us known the amount of work it would take to make this movie when we started, I don't know if we would be here today because it was just like a one step at a time process. On, in our post-production office, we put up these like three month calendars. It was like December, January, February. And like February 20th was like circled. It's the day we deliver the movie, we'll be done. And then every every few weeks, we would have a niche getting up on the desk, taping up a new calendar, March, and then April, and then May, and then all the way until December, we just kept adding calendars. And part of part of it, what makes what makes it such a you know technical and creative like feat for them is not only did they have to figure out how to do all this stuff in a way that had never been done before, not only did they have to use these like high-end editing software in ways that they were not designed for. I remember one day we had a technician come over to like look at someone else's computer and they looked, they came and looked at Eric and like, oh, your computers are all messed up. Because every five minutes they would crash. And, and I mentioned to Art, like we became really oh. religious in the editing of this film. Like, and what I mean by that is every few hours, this rainbow beach ball or whatever you call it would just pop oh. up and it would just start spinning and all five of us would get on our knees and start praying to it and hoping it wouldn't erase the last three hours of footage that we just like processed. It's not, it's not merciful. And it usually would, exactly, it would erase everything. Yeah. So what that meant was the editing timelines, you know, so for, you know for, for those of you listening who like know how to edit obviously, like you have a timeline where you put like a video track, you put an audio track, and a lot of films might have like one track for video, a second track for like titles, maybe one more like track like and maybe like five or six audio tracks our movie had 37 video tracks i mean and that is before we got into like the really specifics like there's probably even more than that but we did something called nesting and that was yeah. the reason why you would ask your editor to make a cut and they would say come back in 20 minutes the computers couldn't handle it and when we finished when we finished the movie as as an incredible gift Anish got, you know, the five of us in the room, it was him, me, Natalie, our producing partner, and Will and Nick, the editors, he got everybody a framed, a beautiful framed photo of the editing timeline, which kind of looks like uh, like the skyline of New York City, because it's like this beautiful yeah. like thing. I, I wish I could show you guys what that looks like, but, um, you know... We'll pop up an image. Okay, we'll, we'll uh, all right, I'll show you guys. Yeah, yeah. Right. You guys want to see it right no, now? It, it, I've never it, it, shown this gorgeous. before, by the way. All right, here we go. Go ahead. Check this out. Awesome. It's literally Let's it's hanging this. on my wall right now. Oh. I was like, literally, he's looking at it the entire yeah. time, too. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, I can't show you. Isn't that really, what, what, what That's a great gorgeous. image he got us, right? I think literally my mom thought it, it was like an abstract representation of New York City. So. Yeah, I mean, it's... It's graphically beautiful, and that it has that like significance too. I, I'd imagine that it's just you're it's, filled with pride looking at a thing like that. It's editor porn, dude. Yeah, it's timeline. <laughs> yeah, that stuff right there. Like when you when I look at something like that, I was like, oh my goodness. I, I love looking at stuff like that. Anytime they yeah. release, I think they did one for Mission Impossible. Uh, the editor oh, really? who does like a bunch I of action see movies. He he show he like shows you a bunch of his editing process, and like every time I see, it, I was like, it's, it's, I don't know, it's crazy. I like it, and yeah. I know any other editor watching. <laughs> Anybody that's who's a dope, spent any that's a dope gift right there. That, yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. I, I love stuff like that. But uh, just wrap it up on some of the other ones that I thought were really cool. Talking about like the influence that you guys had with the internet, Reddit being one of the bigger things. Uh, if you want to mention a bit on that, but I, I just love how you guys yeah. had anytime it was on YouTube, just like the algorithm stuff, where obviously he would be searching up stuff dealing with recitals. So that's what you see in the mm -hmm. recommended. 
Obviously, you guys worked on some short films and some commercials, so that would also be on there. But I loved how you already had honest trailers. Yes, I'm a huge <laughs> ready fan for of your trailers. own movie. Honest That's, trailers, I watch like, every Tuesday religiously, and we in the movie there's a brief moment where you could see one of the YouTube videos in the bottom right corner. If you really look closely, it looks like David and Vic at the lake site, which is not unusual, right? He would be seeing news mm-hmm. footage. But it looks like the edge of the Honest Trailers logo on top of it. It's not the actual logo, but it looks like it. Yeah. I'm also a huge fan of TVTropes.org, if you guys know what that is. Mm-hmm. Dude, I caught that one on the last one. Yes. Hey, you saw My it? girlfriend was like, what's TV Tropes? She noticed that. I was like, this small dude, He snuck that in there, I didn't I love, he? dude, for me, one of the most surreal things was just looking at the TV Tropes.org of searching. Like, that is so cool for us. So when he types in Tumblr for a brief moment, I think the editors or Anish came up with this. Like, it shows you TV Tropes. Um, one of my favorite things on Reddit is this is this subreddit called R Dash Movie Details, and mm-hmm. it's always yeah. finding really incredible um, things that you would never notice. I remember like on Spider Man Homecoming, in the in the movie, Peter Parker is like looking at a YouTube video of himself as Spider Man swinging around, and if you ever pause your DVD and like go to that actual URL, a video pops up which is like the Spider Man Homecoming trailer. Hmm. So it's kind of crazy, like how yeah. It, it just, so. Just a hint to you guys, we may have done the same thing with a couple of YouTube videos. Oh, That's not my magnum opus part two, by the way. That I'm not going to uh-huh. reveal anything else other than it's in the first <laughs> half of the movie. But we, you know, it was just, it was like, you know, this movie is our love letter to the internet in a lot of ways. And I think hopefully it comes across that we didn't want to make a movie that was condemning the internet or internet culture. Right. It was kind of trying to look at it as, as, in as holistic as a way as possible. And part of that was also just like giving these shout outs to all these really cool things that could bring us joy every day. Had I known you guys, I would have definitely had a reference to you guys at the time. Maybe on the oh, next one. Like, really dude, sweet. I was so touched because I, I saw Hereditary a couple months ago. And I was with Natalie. And we were in a packed audience uh, here in L.A. at the Grove. And we were shook. Like, that film Fantastic grabbed movie. us. I felt like the entire audience was, like, holding on to each other. Yeah. Like, we were all one big unit, like, just fearing for our lives. I thought that film was freaking incredible and when i got home that night i just started looking up videos about it and one of the videos of course art was your video and i'm just like you know i'm home i'm like getting ready to go to sleep i'm terrified of this movie that i watched and then in the middle of your video you interrupted the video and talked about how searching was your favorite movie of the year and i was like dude this doing it dude, every i know man i'm like dude i i hope you find my magnum opus so i can give you that exclusive and I'm here we are. Right I'm, at, I'm, I'm at weddings. They're like, does anyone object? I'm like, nope. But if y'all have seen Searching. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. Oh, yeah, no. I, I've, I've been telling you this and everyone else. If you haven't seen Searching, maybe this video. Some of you don't care about spoilers. Hopefully <laughs> right. this did it for you. I'm telling you, the people behind this movie have done a fantastic job. Thank you again uh, for joining us and, and, and just being able to cover some of the stuff in there. Thank you, Art. I Thanks, look forward Zach. to seeing the DVD. I look forward to the – what's the title of the next movie again? Run. Run. He refuses to say anything about it because he knows the moment he sleeps up a little bit, I'm I'm, going to have it all done. I'm actually kind of curious. You said that there's an Easter egg referencing Run. You're not going to tell us, but has anybody reached out to you about the Run Easter eggs in Searching? No. No one's found it? Not yet. Did I tell you guys about... um... Yeah, go ahead. You're home. Did I tell you guys about the Star Wars uh, Rogue Squadron? game i think that was the name yeah 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 so like you know we had this conversation previously but um there was this like n64 game where you like play like these starships uh you know in star wars and like there was you could add these cheat codes and if you put the certain cheat code if you put farm boy it would give you the millennium falcon that game came that game was well loved and that game went like people just forgot about it and then a couple years later episode one came out in theaters and it was unheard of. Like the game developers released this like code that if you typed in the code into your like several year old N64 game, it would allow you to fly as the Naboo Starfighter, which was in the new movie. Well, like and that game came out. It was like it was mind blowing that like they had that foresight. And you know, like I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the Arkham Asylum games, the Batman ones. Like you yeah. know, they planted something in Arkham about Arkham City in Arkham Asylum in the right. warden's yeah. office. You guys know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, mm-hmm. dude, all of so, them, all the way up to night. Yeah, so exactly. So that origins. Was, so yeah, same. And, and basically, that was that was kind of our thinking with searching. So 
there's there's things in there and you know Pixar does a great job of that every Pixar movie has right. a tiny Fantastic. you know like harmless little thing that little do you know is a reference to the next one so it was kind of hopefully our our thing that we could do I we'll love see. it. I can't. I can't wait to see it yet again on DVD. There's or Blu-ray. There's a bunch of other things that are out there. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, guys. I have been telling you this. I can't wait for the future with your future films when people start talking about this is this year searching. That's crazy. This man. is the, this is the searching that. of this generation. I love it. I'm glad that people have finally gotten a chance to see it, and uh, I'm glad that you guys have had a bunch of success with it, and that people are loving it because I've been loving it. Just trying to get the word out there for you. Thanks, so, man. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, can't wait to can't wait to have you on for run. <laughs> That'd be great. And and whatever other cinematic craziness that you have said. But if you had nothing else to say, thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys next time. Thank you guys.